Good afternoon and welcome back to our Politico um, Future of Food and Farming Summit. Um, we hope you have enjoyed the session so far. Um, for those who are just joining us, my name is Gabriela Galindo and I'm, gonna, uh, and I'm an agri-food reporter for Politico Europe. And I'm going to be joined now by um, Mr. Lu Minister Luis Planas uh, of, for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food of Spain. Um, Mr. Planas, uh, buenos dias. I would be delighted to be able to conduct this interview in Spanish, but um, we're going to go ahead in English. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to remind our audience to tweet and to submit the questions um, via the Swap Card app. Um, Minister Planas, good morning. Thanks for a good afternoon. Thanks for being here with us. Good afternoon. Happy to be with you uh, from, uh, from Madrid. And uh, thanks for the invitation to this uh, conference organized by Politico and all your partners in this event. Great, great. Um, so we only have 25 minutes and there's a lot of ground that um, it would be great to cover. Um, I would like to discuss uh, the CAP, the work that you are doing now to finalize the strategic plans that you have to submit to the European Commission by the end of the year. And I'd also like to discuss aspects of trade and focus on Spain's um, climate and sustainability challenges. So I'm going to um, dive right into it. Um, so, as, as I said, you're in the process of finalizing these strategic plans. And uh, one question that I would like to ask is, um, there's been reports in the media about um, uh, farmers organizations, like big farmers organizations like Asaha, are that, who are not happy about the way that these strategic plans are going. On the other side, we have um, proponents of more agroecology, um, agriculture, who are also um, not happy. So I would like to ask you, how are you managing to keep both of these sides happy and how, how do you see um, the, the, the strategic plans that you're going to deliver to Brussels, um, keeping everyone on all sides um, content? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you are uh, you are right. Uh, uh, changes are always uh, difficult, and to prepare the national strategic plan of Spain is probably uh, one of the greatest challenging, uh, can we say, tasks that uh, I have to confront in the, in uh, from the day of uh, I take office in June uh, uh, 2018, just when the Commission. Uh, presented its proposals on the new uh, CAP. So I follow day by day, week by week, uh, month by month, all the discussions uh, on the European uh, level and the, the agreements that we have reached in Brussels and Luxembourg about the new CAP. And now I have uh, logically, the, in parallel, the great discussion uh, in my country, in Spain, uh, the first thing I, I want to say is that uh, Spain will be there on time. Uh, before the 31st of December, I will present to the European Commission on behalf of, uh, of Spain uh, the uh, strategic national plan of, of my country. Uh, and the preparations have begun uh, quite far away. So uh, from uh, 2019, uh, January, we have begun uh, a process of discussion with uh, with the regions, the Comunidades Autonomas, with the farmers' organizations, with cooperative, with the industry, with the rural organizations, and also with the environmental organizations. We have held more than uh, uh, 200 meetings uh, in the ministry with all of them. And uh, apart from that, we have done, I think, uh, an extensive uh, research and uh, uh, analyzing all the sectors and subsectors of our, uh, can we say, uh, agronomic world, and uh, also uh, uh, making swap analyze and uh, 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 design the interventions that we have to, to, to do. Uh, yep. what, is the, what is the, what's the issue about? The issue is that Spain is a very large country with very different agronomic Circumstances We have in the north, uh, can we say, the classic uh, Central European productions that we have in the south, nearly subtropical production. So that means that uh, this disparity and with 17 regions that uh, make us uh, a near uh, federal country, even in some subjects more with more regional competence at the federal country, means that all this process is, uh, is quite a complex one. So... Is perfectly Indeed, yeah. natural. 
fairly natural i close my 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 remarks i i i uh, it's perfectly natural that from different regions there are different views but it happens also inside the organizations so my duty as the national minister is to present one strategic plan to brussels and i have to put all these elements uh, together Okay, thanks. Um, one of the key elements that um, are a characteristic of this new cap are the eco schemes, with which you have said previously that are really key and um, to to support Europe in, in their ecological transition. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what eco schemes you're thinking of rolling out? And um, I had a question because in the in the preparation that you have done so far, um, you, you decided, your ministry decided to use only one eco scheme per farm. Could you explain why you made that choice? Yes, sure. I think eco schemes are probably, with a strategic plan, the great uh, two great new things of the new uh, CAP. And uh, I have already talked about the strategic plan. Now uh, we come to the eco schemes and all the environment related decisions that we have to take to, uh, well, to have at least 40%. In the case, Spanish case, it will be more than 40% of the funds related to the, to the protection of the environment and the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, I have to say that we have, uh, uh, in our design, we will have 1.1 uh, 1 billion euros a, a year in Spain for the eco schemes, it's quite a large sum. And we are thinking about uh, improvement, the carbon balance and also on agroecology. As you said, okay. with, uh, with uh, eco schemes, that will be one uh, per farmer or per, per, per production, no per more. Farm. Because uh, we that? think that, uh, but at the same time, uh, giving the room that everyone gets uh, this payment. I think that is bad that we begin a competition between different farmers to have more or less. What is important is that all are involved. And I have to say that is a voluntary payment. It's not a compulsory payment. So people can choose to have these practices or not. But I think it's very, very important that uh, uh, everyone has the chance to have an eco scheme. And uh, that will mean a lot of work, I think, uh, of advising and also of explaining the content of this uh, new thing coming. Yeah, OK. Um, one of the criticisms that I would like to also ask you about, uh, still about this choice of only one eco scheme, is that perhaps it doesn't support um, farmers who are already well engaged in agroecological practices to um, get a better um, stance in the market. Um, I understand that the questions that um, that factored in your choice was to allow more farmers, as, as many farmers as possible, to benefit from the schemes. Um, but wouldn't it make sense as well, given that um, we're really trying to reach the Green Deal targets, the farm to fork targets, to support um, farmers who are already well engaged in agroecological? farmers and could benefit from more than one eco scheme? Well, uh, uh, it's very clear that the eco schemes mean something extra from the one, the things that we have been doing before. The, the former green payment is, also, is now included in the uh, support income payment, so that, uh, that is there. We have also, in the second pillar, rural development, the question of the agro-environmental uh, measures, and we have to differentiate the one to the other. So what is very clear is that we are uh, trying to get the most, and uh, the people that have been already doing things can continue doing. Probably the one you mentioned, if I understood well, you were mentioning uh, organic farming, will be supported through the second pillars to the, uh, can we say, region uh, intervention that I think is the best way to tackle the issue. For me, is a priority, but the question is that uh, it's very clear the design of the eco schemes is a design to do more than we have done before.
Thanks. Okay, and I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned organic farming, indeed, because an another thing that jumps out from your strategic plans um, planning is that there is no specific eco scheme for organic farming. You've just mentioned that this was included in the second pillar, um, rather. Um, but I, I just want to ask again: Wouldn't it make sense to have an organic um, eco scheme? I don't know, perhaps to catch up with the Austrians who are really far ahead in the in the organic uh, production. Well, I, I have to say that uh, first of all, uh, Spain, uh, we have uh, two point uh, uh, four. Uh, million hectares in organic farming, uh, nearly uh, nearly 9.5 percent of our agricultural land. So we are the the can we say the first producers of the EU of about uh, organic uh, farming products. So I have to say that we have uh, some experience about. Uh, I want to develop in line with uh, farm to fork uh, to the objective of these. Uh, 25% uh, by the end uh, of the decade. And uh, I'm sure, for example, I am thinking about olive oil that we, we uh, uh, even uh, done by three uh, the number of the surface that we have now with, uh, with organic uh, farming. But uh, we had a great debate with the uh, 17 regions and there were, can we say, uh, minority and majority opinions uh, about how to support organic farming. And we have to decided to do it uh, uh, through the second pillar interventions. Uh, because if not, there was a great uh, uh, issue and many difficulty to identify. And I think that all the measures that we have to, uh, been taking about uh, improvement of carbon balance or agroecology are the best design uh, to, can we have to have to achieve new results. So it's not that we put uh, back uh, organic farming. On the contrary, for me, is an absolute priority in uh, value added of the production, but we have decided to support it through second pillar. Okay. Um, the commissioner yesterday, we, uh, my colleague Sosha interviewed him, and he was v um, just launching the EU Organics Day, and he said he was uh, looking forward and really expecting um, member states to include the support um, for organic farming in their strategic plans. Um, uh, uh, the, the DG Agri's um, top official um, today also said that um, the Commission would be looking for um, this kind of support in their approval um, of the Member States' strategic plans. Um, are you confident that um, Brussels will uh, approve Spain's strategic plans at, uh, at, at this stage? Yeah, yeah sure. In uh, no, our national strategic plans, we will uh, have a specific, uh, can we say, mention an aspect related to organic farming, one side, and others, for example, uh, horizontal issues related to animal welfare. Uh, I think that uh, all these issues have to be tackled. Uh, we are talking about uh, interventions, we are talking about payments, but uh, we are talking about the great challenges that we have uh, ahead of us. So uh, we have to include it and it will be included in our, in our plan. Okay, so you think the, the Commission will get the okay to the to Madrid's strategic plans once? I, I hope so. I hope so. We need it. Uh, we need uh, in the first quarter of uh, 2022 to have the approval if, we are, if our farmers uh, want to get the money. Okay. Um, another uh, aspect that I wanted to tackle is um, the specific um, climate challenges that are that are facing um, Spain, and one of them is um, water scarcity and, and the this phenomenon of desertification. Um, you uh, at at the moment um, the olive oil sector that you mentioned earlier is celebrating um, the olive oil affair during which you expressed uh, strong support for, for the Spanish olive oil industry. One question that I had is, it's, uh, this industry is really water intensive, so um, how are you managing um, these, two, um, yeah, these two imperatives to address the big problem that Spain has with water scarcity and desertification, all the while you support an industry that is um, key to the Spanish economy and to Spanish farmers, but who, which is putting a lot of stress on this lack of water um, that Spain is facing? Well, uh, I think that the solution is uh, quite uh, easy and quite difficult, is uh, sustainable irrigation. Uh, I think that we have to transform our system of irrigation and to get uh, the most of every, can we say, uh, drop of water. 
that's the key. Uh, we are with Israel probably the country in the world with more uh, skilled systems of uh, of use of water. And also we have to make use of non-conventional waters uh, in the future. I was addressing the issue last week in the G20, in the open fora, and I was specifically uh, talking about uh, irrigation and uh, challenges uh, uh, in front of us. And I think that is perfectly possible, even uh, knowing that we'll have uh, less water in the time to come, that we can address that. But largely climate change and only environmental issues makes also that we have to take care, for example, of soil. Uh, and as you mentioned, the desertification is a, is a real, real problem. So is why we have, uh, can we say, to invest uh, not only on soil, about water, about uh, air, uh, about uh, biodiversity and about the landscape. That is, uh, that is very, very clear. The, the future of our farming and uh, and the future of our country. Yep. Okay. I think we only have like around ten minutes left, and I would really like to address the issue of trade. Um, you're um, you, you are very um, positive on, on the notion of the EU developing these um, so-called mirror clauses that um, France has is, has said is going to push for when they take over the EU Council presidency next year, which would consist in ensuring that anything that comes into the EU respects the production standards that farmers are going to be subject to. Um, this morning, though, we heard from U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack that that was not quite the way he saw things. Um, uh, do you fear there that there could be um, a sort of clash between how the EU is approaching the issue of sustainability and how the US is doing that and whether that could bring any troubles um, on the trade front for the EU? Well, uh, I have to say that, uh, first of all, as a minister, I have to protect and defend the interests of my citizens and logically of my farmers. And every uh, uh, EU minister does that. And we are also the commission, and we have to have a common vision. And we have a common vision inside the EU. For example, when finishing the cup, there was a discussion between uh, Parliament, Council, and Commission about, and we get uh, some results uh, during the, the discussion. But it's very clear that we cannot accept that uh, the conditions, a level playing field, our farmers and the product that are imported from third countries, the same products are put on different, can we say, bases. At the same time, I, I, I realized, and I had many conversations during the G20 meeting I was mentioning before in Florence last week with other non-EU ministers, that these, uh, can we say, this uh, war exists. And so we have to be very clear and we have to have a frank dialogue uh, about the issue. Other countries have chosen different, uh, can we say, uh, path roads at the one that we are adopting. But I think that is very, very important that we have a frank dialogue and we have no intentions to create extra barriers or, as it was mentioned 20 years ago, a fortress Europe. But we have to defend the interests of our producers and we have to defend uh, a, level, a level playing field that will be, can we say, fair and balanced. And just one question, because I think we're running out of time. Do you fear that this could, um, you know, at, at the moment, the US and the EU are really trying to iron out all of the um, trade spats that came, came up during the previous administration? Do you fear, again, that this could sort of throw that out of balance and I, send I, you back into this sort of like trade spat situation that we are just emerging from? Uh, I, I hope it, does, it is not the case, frankly speaking. I have been always a great supporter of the transatlantic uh, dialogue and uh, strengthening our relations in every aspect. And I have to say that on agri-food, we are uh, two of the major exporters of the world. So it's very clear that uh, what we are talking about, the standards, is very, very important. Uh, in uh, the EU, we have the highest standards of food security, we are looking also about environment and uh, social issues uh, uh, that are uh, uh, very important for all of us, but we have to do it openly. We have to do it uh, uh, in a dialogue with our partners and, and, and the US is a strategic partner and also in conformity with the WTO rules. Uh, it will not be easy, but if we are frank and we have trust uh, in each other, we can do it. It is true that uh, the states is more going in the quest in the way, for example, of the new genome uh, techniques and the genome 
uh, editing that for me is also important, but we cannot relate all the new food production that we needed for the world only to this. We have to have a sustainable production in quantity, but also in quality. Mm. And um, in the on, on the issue of animal welfare that you also mentioned uh, before, um, just to wrap up, we have a panel on that. Um, uh, three EU countries, Netherlands, Germany and Luxembourg, um, expressed their um, support for a ban on live animal e exports from the EU. Um, Spain is a big animal, um, live animal uh, exporter. Um, what do you think of this and are you, do you think that it is time uh, in light of the greater calls for animal welfare concerns for Spain to maybe turn away from that from that market from that road well we are not the only uh, live animal exporter of the eu uh, I, uh, there are others that uh, do it uh, i don't think that the question is yes or no uh, i am prepared to discuss and ourselves we have taken the initiative to suggest to the european commission measures to improve animal welfare in this condition but i think that the solution is not to ban the solution is to improve the conditions of the transport, and we can do a lot about that. Okay, great. Um, we have one more, one question from the from the audience um, on a completely different subject. They want to know um, from you: Is Nutri-Score labeling appropriate for a food quality scheme? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Understand the question. Yes, we have a question about food labeling that is coming up. So, completely different yeah, subject, okay. but um, uh, so. Someone from the audience wants to know if you support Nutri-Score labouring, if you think this is an appropriate scheme for the EU's um, harmonised um, scheme. Yeah, well, if I understand well, you're talking about labelling or about fruit labelling, is that? Yes. Sorry? Sorry? Ah, uh, Nutri-Score. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, Nutri-Score. <laughs> Good point, excuse me. <laughs> I didn't understand your question. Uh, this is a problem of this uh, video can we say, interviews. No, uh, my position is very simple. Uh, each one of us has a vision of this issue. Uh, the Commission will have to present, uh, uh, I think, by the end of the next year, a proposal about the issue. Uh, I am a strong defender of the Mediterranean diet. And Mediterranean diet means that, for example, products like olive oil uh, 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 play a central role in can we say in the ingredients of the of can we say of food and what we have every day uh, of the year and I think that frankly speaking NutriScore is an attempt that have uh, positive aspects but is not the solution for that and I think that uh, from this point of view I I fully accept that some countries on a voluntary basis have uh, adopted this private system of uh, labeling. But uh, it's not the, the, my way, it's not my opinion, it's not the, government, the Spanish government uh, position about the issue. And we have to have a discussion to find the best solution to increase uh, the information to consumers, but at the same time not to penalize some products that, uh, you know, all the researchers and all the, can we say, the nutritionists uh, think are good. Yep. And in this particular score, where certain products are normally, and I will not mention any one, come to the top in a very strange situation, products that everyone realizes are good for health are not in a good position. So simple like that. Yep, so something from the EU Commission to Mole as they prepare this rolling out of the scheme. Minister Planners, we are out of time. Thank you very much for replying to all of my questions and for joining us. And um, for the audience, um, stay tuned. We have a discussion on animal welfare that is going to be chaired by my colleague Eddie. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon.